If I go to an organization that has a cloud first approach, then they have really no idea what their best practices are, what their guardrails are in general within the deployment of their resources and services, then you know, you're already behind the process. And that's not just a security thing, that's just in general, just best practices around cloud strategy and also cloud migrations. Hi, you're listening to the Secure Developer. It's part of the DevSecCon community. Join us June 23rd for DevSecCon 24. It's a free, global, vendor-neutral, community-driven conference that connects developers, security, and operations teams to learn and enable the integration of security into their development practices. Find out more at devsecon.com. This podcast is sponsored by Sneak. Sneak is a dev-first security company, helping companies fix vulnerabilities in their open-source components and containers without slowing down development. To learn more, visit sneak.io, S-N-Y-K dot I-O. On today's episode, Guy Pajani, founder of Sneak, talks to Jonathan Keith. Jonathan is the Director of Information Security for Viacom CBS Digital. With over 20 years of experience in information security, cybersecurity, cloud security, and cloud architecture, He has worked as a subject matter expert in the informed security domains across several industries, such as banking and finance, federal government, and media entertainment. His area of expertise are in container security, infrastructure as code, application security, and network security. Jonathan has a Master's of Science in Information Systems with an emphasis in cybersecurity, as well as several industry-leading certificates. He's currently managing an InfoSec team of several security architects and security engineers with initiatives to advance container security and zero trust throughout the entire Viacom CBS digital organization. We hope you enjoyed their conversation and don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes if you enjoyed today's episode. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning back in. Today, we're going to go into the world of media and enterprise and just sort of securing uh, at scale, uh, but in an empowered fashion. And to, to dig into all of those, we have with us Jonathan Keith, who is the Director of Information Security slash CISO of Viacom CBS Streaming. Jonathan, thanks for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me. So Jonathan, before we dig in, can you tell us a little bit about what is it you do as a director of InfoSec and also just a bit about how you got into security and uh, and into this spot? Sure, absolutely. So as the director of information security for Viacom CBS Streaming, I'm responsible for overseeing several brands, 10 plus brands within our ecosystem, from our sports digital to our Paramount Plus platforms. We're basically responsible for delivering content to our direct to consumer and developing our direct to consumer applications. So in, in our world, you know, we have a plethora of security engineers and security architects that work directly with the site, you know, reliability engineers and also the web developers on making security as a process that's baked into development. So we're very hands-on, uh, we're very involved in the development of the applications. We're very involved in the development of configuration management within the cloud and building out cloud security where it's a a seamless process for the business partners. And, you know, for me, you know, my my journey in security started roughly 15 years ago. I started off in the financial services, sort of predate what is now considered to be fintech. For me, you know, I started off with somewhat of a business background in business and marketing, but then IT security was also a passion of mine. So, you know, we're we're talking, you know, 2007, 2008, roughly when, you know, there was a lot of changes going on in the economy. There was a lot of changes going on in the real estate market. And, you know, we saw more and more financial services really had a need for security across their IT platforms. And I just saw an opportunity to quickly get into the industry and just pretty much hone my skills and, and develop the passion that I had which eventually led into the cybersecurity world, which also led into what is now basically a primary focus on cloud security. So uh, that journey took me through a lot, you know, working for FinTech, working through some government agencies, also, you know, working for some smaller FinTech organizations and now into the media and entertainment segment. So it's come full circle to where I really saw myself being 15 years ago. I see myself now in my role, which is pretty much the ideal role for me with the combination of me having 
a strong cybersecurity, cloud security, and, and business aptitude. Yeah, got it. Well, it's sort of a, a rich uh, journey. I'm curious, like, how did you how did you get the sort of the first step into security, kind of moving from the business side to uh, to kind of uh, to tech land and, and sort of uh, security land? It was actually an accident, to be honest. I was working for, uh, I live in the Atlanta metropolitan area, and I was working for a bank, and they had an internal incident uh, within one of our marketing departments. And at the time, there was a security team, but it was a fairly small security team, and they didn't have a whole lot of knowledge on the application that was compromised. Well, I had more knowledge around the application that we were using, but then they had a little bit more of the security protocols, but I quickly caught on to what the security protocols were. And we quickly realized what the vulnerabilities were and what the flaws, the security flaws were within the application in itself. And they were like, you should come work for us. (laughs) So I'm like, sure, how much are you paying? (laughs) So it just became a natural transition. Got it. Well, it's a a great opportunity seizing moment, you know, there to uh, dive and open up what became a pretty awesome career. So yeah, to, uh, before we dig into security and, and development and all the sort of the great initiatives you, you mentioned, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, just organizational structure for it? Like you're running the security team. What does the security team look like and how does it relate to the sort of the product the development teams? Sure. So my security team is made up of roughly 12 individuals. So half are, are senior level engineers and the other half are senior level architects. From my team standpoint of view, we handle various security domains around application security, around secure SDLC. We also help build out configuration management for the development teams throughout the different business partners. So our different business partners expand through, like I said, our sports digital world, our Paramount Plus world, and within their world, Basically, they have direct access and direct responsibility to the development of the applications, but yet they work through us to make sure that, like I said earlier, that they're baking in security standards into the application development. I take more of a proactive approach as opposed to a reactive approach. You know, I know a lot of security professionals are into, you know, doing the web application scanning and gathering the vulnerabilities and the findings and things of of that nature. And a lot of times to me, that leads to be more reactive as opposed to proactive. What I like to do is make sure from development to QA into production, we're actually finding vulnerabilities, whether it's the vulnerabilities within the code, whether it's vulnerability within images, you know, we're heavily on looking into our Kubernetes security and our Kubernetes clusters making sure things are private when they should be private, public when they should be public from a networking standpoint of view, looking at container network interfaces. So we're across the board looking at all aspects of the infrastructure that supports the application that would eventually deliver the content to our consumers. Yeah, and when you say we in this context, is it the security team that's looking at these kind of vulnerabilities or sort of these security assessments at the different phases? Is it the teams that run them? Like how does the... How does sort of the the interaction or I don't know if it's division of responsibility? It is a security team, but we're in direct communication with the developers. We're in direct communication with DevOps and the DevOps leadership as we're reviewing these reports and we're reviewing these findings because we believe in knowledge is power. We believe in keeping them educated on the findings and not just passing down a directive because there are situations where we may not have direct access to the cloud environment. We may not have direct access to the actual you know, EC2 instance or the cluster itself. So therefore, albeit we discover the finding, we're not the ones who necessarily have the access to remediate. So we do have to work and communicate with the DevOps and the different developers through the brands and therefore being able to make sure that we apply some sort of fix or some sort of remediation based on the findings that we have discovered. Got it. So it's definitely a shared responsibility. Yeah, understood. So you're, I guess, maybe deep diving into this, and we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk DevSecOps in a sec here. So as your security team, if we talk about the practicalities of it, right? As your security team runs those scans, what does it look like? Does the scans run in like the build process? They ship data out. I'm just I'm trying to think about scaling, kind of learnings and tips and tricks, you know, around how does your what I imagine is sort of a outnumbered <laughs> security uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. security team kind of collaborate with larger engineering folks. Sure. So, I mean, we have a plethora of tools and services. Um, you know, we have a set of tools that are directly involved in the build phase. 
for example, we can tie in a lot of our container security platforms into their CI CD pipelines. We can also have them installed daemon sets on the hosts that are actually running their containers. Uh, we can also use scanner CLIs, basically a CLI format with scanners for them to be able to directly run those type of scans directly on their images within their repositories, whether they're using a GCR.io or ECR.io or GitHub, you know, we can use those CLIs to be able to run those scans and return those findings. We also have tools that we use to scan the entire infrastructure where basically we can look at configuration and configuration management by scanning the infrastructure and returning anything that's failed as far as an insight that is not considered to be best practice. So we'll have certain packs that we run through those tools. So we'll use like CIS benchmarks or we'll use some CSA benchmarks, things of that nature to be able to discover those findings. And once we get all that into a report or into a user interface from there, we either share that information, that report directly with the business partners, or they are actually have access to the user interface so they can be able to discover some of those findings in real time. And there are situations where within the CICD pipeline, they can actually apply remediation in real time. So we can actually turn on auto remediation if necessary. So therefore, there's not really any human interaction in some of those cases. It's just a process that we have in place and both the DevOps and the security personnel are educated and involved in that process. And how do you decide between these two, I guess it's not two approaches, right? But between when does a security person need to sort of review the results or assess them and sort of drive them versus when does, you know, your team maybe like own the tool or sort of, you know, put the tool in place to, to sort of get the security insight, but just expecting the development team to act on the results. It depends on the business partner and it depends on the knowledge of the developers within that business partner. Some business partners have more autonomy than others because they actually have someone within their DevOps that has some sort of security responsibility within that business. Others do not. So it's not really a cookie cutter approach. I mean, we know our business partners, we know their business and we know where we have to be more involved from start to finish in the information security process. So we do have some business partners that do have their own, let's say, for example, security expert who just so happens to be a DevOps person. And in those cases, they will have full autonomy and access to our services and tools where they can apply some of those remediations. In some cases, they can even run those scans themselves, whereas others don't have that luxury. You know, they may be a smaller business and they may just have subject matter experts around SRE or just around web development and they know absolutely nothing about information security or cloud security. For those, we offer more support, more service. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Kind of adapt to the surrounding. You're building it. You're, you know, I'm sure tools and techniques have evolved. You know, what's a top tip, you know, of a, of a practice or a technique that uh, you've grown more fond of uh, over the last year or so? Make sure you keep your people trained. <laughs> I just, I can't say that enough. Whether it's your security personnel or whether you're working directly with DevOps and and you're training them on, on how to use the tools and services, provide them with training and workshops and make sure they clearly understand the functionality and the features of the tools. If not, you're pretty much asking for trouble <laughs> if you don't. Because if you just hand someone the keys to a kingdom and, and without giving them training, then you're going to have a lot of false positives. You know, you're going to miss misconfigurations and it's really going to defeat the purpose of having that shared responsibility because you haven't provided them with the proper knowledge and the proper training. Yeah, that sounds like a lesson learned, you know, <laughs> a hard, a hard earned lesson. So this would be training. You're not talking about sort of, you know, secure coding education as therapy. You're talking about training is make the most out of the tooling that you have in place to ensure that they are, I guess, testing for the things that, that you're aiming them to test for. Yeah, that would be slightly separate. I mean, do we, that would be different than doing something like secure coding training or doing training on secure SDLC. This is actually training and workshops around using certain tools and services that we have available to the business partners so that we're not just passing on a service to them or passing on a tool and giving them access to it without giving them the knowledge that they need to understand the features and the functionality within the tool. Yeah, got it. Understood. So I guess kind of, and along that vein, you know, what are, I guess, if you think about the top practices, so if you come to a new business partner, hopefully none of them are really at kind of a point blank, but still you're kind of, you know, working with a team that is a, a bit more nascent. What's your sort of 
typical priority list of what do you put in place first? For me, I like to take a look at what is their process around their cloud security, you know, currently within if they're a multi cloud environment, taking a look at their configuration management within the cloud. Next, I like to take a look at the application security. I like to have a clear understanding of the application architecture, you know, what are the primary languages that they're using, and basically who are the individuals supporting uh, those applications. And then after that, the third thing for me is probably more into trying to figure out more about the risk management around the organization. How does the organization currently manage risk? How does the organization currently determine what really is their risk? You know, because certain business practices can tolerate more risk than others. Certain business practices are in a position to accept risk more than others. Some have a higher risk appetite. So I like to kind of go in that particular order, depending upon the setup of the organization. But I think the three go hand in hand and they kind of chronologically stack in that particular order because you first have to get an understanding of the environment. You first you have, secondly, you have to get an understanding of the applications that are basically driving the business and generating revenue. And then you need to clearly understand what is the risk that's being introduced from doing the previous two. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. So you were saying, you know, if I echo this correctly, echo back, you're looking at some core practices first to sort of understand just like a methodology around security. And then after you go through that in cloud and application, and those are kind of my trigger words, sex, so I'll, I'll come back to those, you know, to that distinction mm-hmm. in a sec. But once you assess those, then you come back to say, okay, now are we smart about knowing where we're focusing for it? Is that kind of a correct view? Correct. I think those three for me are the, what I would call the core competencies. Yeah. I think those are the competencies across not only information security and cybersecurity, just the organization in general. Because if I go to an organization that has a cloud first approach, then they have really no idea what their best practices are, what their guardrails are in general within the deployment of their resources and services, then you know, you're already behind the process. And that's not just a security thing, that's just in general, just best practices around cloud strategy and also cloud migrations. So let's get back a little bit into that cloud and application security. So I find, and I you know I'm fully biased, you know, that those lines are getting blurry a little bit, right? You kind of you come into it, a lot of cloud is sort of managed as applications. How do you, when you think about cloud security versus application security, how do you draw the line? You know, what do you put in what bucket? I think for me, with application security for our business in the media and entertainment world, sometimes we're at a slight disadvantage because we have to think about our customer. And our customers are the general public. It could be anyone, it could be a customer. So we have to think about delivering content as securely as possible, but at the same time, making sure we're providing what our customer is paying for, because they're paying for a service. So there are some times where we have to have some compensated controls. We may not be able to be as secure or as locked down as I would like to be in my world, but at the same time, we wanna make sure at least we're mitigating any threats or any risk around that direct consumer, you know, content delivery that basically drives our businesses or drives our revenue is the reason why everyone in the organization has a job. Whereas from a cloud security standpoint of view, I think that's where we can make up the difference because our customer doesn't have a clue what runs in the background. Our customer doesn't have a clue of the infrastructure. They don't know the difference between whether we're running an application on the GKE cluster or if it's running on a series of, of auto-scaling EC2 instances. So therefore we can make sure that we add a little extra layer of security there that we're looking at layer three, layer four, and layer seven risk and, la- and vulnerabilities and making sure that we're adding the necessary security controls. So at the end of the day, our applications that reside in those environments and rely on those resources can do what the application is intended to do and that's deliver the con- deliver the content to the customers. So I think that's where the balance is. And that was one of my first challenges when I, when I came to this organization, because I knew I'm thinking content delivery, I'm thinking customer and I'm thinking revenue. So at the end of the day, I can't hinder the drive of the revenue, but I still got to make sure I'm protecting the customer and also the organization. Yeah, interesting. So it's sort of a, there's the customer orientation and then there's kind of the infrastructure versus sort of a code maybe aspects of it. So I guess within that mix, for instance, when you think about container security or you think about infrastructure as code security, 
how do you bucket them? Like, do they fall under the infrastructure bucket and kind of the platform and sort of keeping the, the customer protected or are they more app? And They're and more app. They're more apps. So we tie our code security and our security SDLC under our application division. So we actually, if you really, if I had to give you a breakdown of my team, so we have specialists that are more focused around AppSec. We have specialists that are more focused around cloud security. And then we also have specialists from the threat intel and threat modeling background. So when it comes to code and code security, and you also got to wrap repository security into that now, because that's where the code resides. And that's where we're seeing some of the biggest risk where, you know, repos are accidentally open up to the public or people are actually embedding secrets in their code. So we wrap that all into our app security. So that helps us from development QA into the actual production phase when that application becomes, you know, open to the public. Yeah, makes sense. So you've been in the industry for a bunch of years now in Hoida, if not your sort of a first rodeo and, you know, DevSecOps is a bit newer than that. And you also, you know, you, you got into Viacom, there were probably some established practices on it. So I imagine it wasn't, there was some change required to sort of embrace DevSecOps. So maybe let's dig into that. Maybe for starters, like how do you, when you're asked what it means to sort of do DevSecOps, you know, what does that start? And then maybe we dig into a little bit about how do you see embarking on the change to kind of get into that mode? And I'm just going to be honest, when I joined initially this organization, so we started off actually at CBS Interactive. And then as we went through the merger of the company, you know, we went through some some reorgs and some name changes, which brought us to where we are today, Viacom CBS Streaming. But when I joined this organization three years ago, there was no DevSecOps. It was basically security versus DevOps. I mean, that was just the reality of the situation, which you see that quite frequently across a lot of organizations. I mean, from a developer standpoint of view, security was often looked upon as a roadblock that, you know, here they have this code that they need to push out to this application because their manager is basically telling them they have to add this new feature to the application. But before they do that, guess what? They got to check with the InfoSec person. And for a long time, they felt like that was a roadblock and delay in their process. So for me, one of my first responsibilities and one of my first initiatives was to build rapport, to build relationships, to show the developers and the DevOps that, you know, we're in this as a team. It's not InfoSec versus you know, DevOps. It's at the end of the day, we're supporting a platform that supports our customer base that provides them with a service and generates revenue. And also, I let them know that we speak their language. I mean, I came from a background of being an architect. I came from a background of being an engineer. I was familiar with programming and programming languages, uh, which made it a whole lot easier to build those relationships and build that rapport. And then as we started building out some of the current tools and services that we provided, uh, we provide to those business partners, we got their buy-in. We had their input. We didn't just go out and just, you know, POC a bunch of tools that, you know, have the title security or SIM or something in the name, we made sure that it was a tool and services that was going to be beneficial and would add value to those developers and to those uh, those brands and to those application owners and some of the stakeholders in many cases. So they understood the reasoning behind why we were doing what we were doing on the security team. It wasn't intended for us to be a roadblock. It was really intended for us to not only provide them with more security posture, help them reduce risk, but also optimize the way they did their development and also improve performance of the overall application, which actually happened because we focused a whole lot in the beginning just on misconfigurations. And just by solving the issue of misconfiguration, a lot of the DevOps teams, they not only optimized their process, but they actually saw improvements across the various applications and it was a no brainer. And then they realized that, hey, this is a different approach. You know, this is not traditional information security. This is more DevSecOps, Sec DevOps, where we're actually working together and developing a partnership and everyone has a vested interest to make sure that we're delivering the content security. Yeah, I, I love the um, quality facets. If you build it right, if you, sort of, if you detect misconfigurations, if you identify security concerns, you'll, you'll help improve other aspects of the, uh, of the system. So this sort of drives this empathy, this sort of, you know, close collaboration, working together versus with them. What was the hardest part about applying this transformation? 
I think the hardest part was getting some of the application owners and some of the leads to open up more on their development process because they own that. And, you know, when they develop their applications, they have a system in place that's probably been in place for years because they understand their business, they understand their customers, and they understand what is intended for them to deliver. Well, for us, the first thing we wanted to do as a part of potentially looking at misconfiguration is also looking at the application architecture. Maybe there's a way we can re-architect something where seamlessly you're actually remediating a problem that has existed for the last two years. So getting them to open up and show us that architect, to show us that inside world of theirs was probably the biggest challenge because there was sort of the the misconception that if we open up that architecture to information security, they're just going to tear it apart or they're just going to force us to re-architect and make changes to something that we've actually worked two or three years to build. And that wasn't the case. It was basically InfoSec coming in, providing a second set of eyes from a different perspective with a group of trained security engineers and security architects that understood the development phase, that understood operations, and here's the recommendation. And that was probably the biggest bridge that we had to cross. And once that level of comfort was there, it made things a whole lot easier for us to now collaborate and work together and have a, a little bit more synergy across the application owners and then information security uh, architects and engineers. Yeah, yeah, no, love that. It's really, it's about establishing trust uh, in there. So, and how did you achieve that? So like you come along, you have those, you know, what are some uh, some techniques? I'm sort of thinking if I'm a, if a listener is in this sort of typical state, you know, how do you, what are some techniques to break through to earn earn that trust? Just jump in the fire. You know, we came in during a time with this process where we had one of the biggest special events of the year going on, and that was the Super Bowl. That was when we were actually hosting streaming the Super Bowl in 2019, which we started preparing for it a year before that in 2018. So that was the first test of whether this process was going to work or not. I mean, it took it in, I would say at least an entire year of working together through various projects, building out different phases of the platforms that were going to support the Super Bowl, because that was actually the first year that we were actually streaming it live as well, too, to really, really open up that trust. Because it's like, if this doesn't work, there's no return. There's no going back. So it either has to work or we're going to have a problem. You know, we're going to have to tear all this down and rebuild relationships all over again. So that was the first initial test. We just jumped in the fire head first. We came up with a lot of strategies, spent a lot of time on Zoom meetings, basically going over, you know, working sessions, architectural calls, and just spending that time together and actually having working sessions and actually literally problem solving in some of these conference calls was really what helped bridge the gap and build that trust and that rapport. You know, we would have different testing phases where let's say we did some workload testing and we'd make a recommendation to re-architect something within the application. The application owner would go back to their team. They'd run that in their test environments. It would be successful. We'd come back the next call and they'd be like, wow, we didn't realize it was going to be that easy. So it's like, yeah, all we had to do was just try it and test. And if it's successful, great. If not, we go back to the drawing board. Got it. You have to jump in. You have to jump in. So how um, this is, you know, a great kind of a improvement of the relationship between sort of DevOps and security and you work together. Another player in this world is the auditors and sometimes, you know, sort of being more empowering or trusting of other teams might be a little bit harder to digest kind of uh, on that front. What was your experience there around, uh, I guess, kind of, has there been a change in your approach to sort of how do you work through audits and uh, and assurances uh, when you embrace DevSecOps? That is still a challenge for us because we actually have a separate group that manages that aspect of our security. So we don't really do direct, say, for example, PCSI DC, DSS audits or our own internal compliance audits is actually handled by a different team that's more on our corporate side. And I think for us, we realized that was a big challenge for the application owner, because instead of putting them in a position where they had to deal with two different groups, we tried to filter a lot of that 
process for them because it could create confusion. It could create ambiguity around, okay, I have this one InfoSec team that is a little bit more technical and a little bit more hands-on, but then I have these auditors that are telling me I need to do this this way, I need to do this that way. So what we tried to do to take some of the workload off the application owners and the DevOps team is we tried to be that liaison. So we would work directly with the auditors and we'd work directly with that the corp side of the information security team and make sure that we were passing on the necessary requirements to the application owner. So we would kind of just funnel everything through one line of communication. Because once again, going back to it, we're in the process of still trying to build relationships ourselves. So we don't want to confuse anyone while we're trying to build out those relationships. So we just tried to follow it. We tried to streamline the process, simplify it and make sure if audits were required, we provided the requirements through some of the architectural reviews or through some of the, the sec dev sec op discussions that we were having with the application owners. So they would not have to directly communicate with the auditors unless it was necessary, unless it was something more like, you know, PCI related where they had no choice but to go through some sort of PCI DSS testing. Yeah, well, definitely, uh, definitely kind of, you know, keep the eye on the target of you as you build the relationships, you know, you, uh, you want to avoid distractions. As much as possible. And, and we get, I mean, once again, we were at the process of, for the first time, streaming a major sporting event. We had never done this before. There were so many pieces to the puzzle. There were so many people involved. The procedures were changing almost on a daily basis. It was a real juggling act, but it was something that I felt like was a great test that when we passed the test, it simplified the process of building relationships and collaborating in the future. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, now you've established something, you know, kind of gone through, exactly. uh, through some market. Exactly. So, John, this has been, you know, there's all sorts of kind of uh, questions and paths we can continue going down. We're kind of getting up to time. I'd love to, before I uh, let you go here, ask one question that I ask every guest coming on, which is if you think about someone sitting in, in your chair, sort of in this, uh, in this role, five years from now, what do you think would be most different about them? And it can be sort of CBS specific, but you know, maybe even just industry wide, you know, what do you think would be most different about their reality? I think for anyone coming into the role, you know, say five years from now to be a CISO or a head of information security or cloud security, I recommend that person maintain their technical prowess as much as possible. I think a lot of times that, you know, with CISOs and other execs, you start getting to a certain level, you feel like you have to move away from the technology side. And I think to me, that is a mistake because the technology is ultimately what's driving our business. It's ultimately how we deliver our content and applications to the industry. So for example, you know, API security is something that if you try to really have that type of discussion with most execs, they're so far removed from that aspect of it. You know, they're not knowledgeable enough to figure out how do we approach that. You know, microservices is going to be a huge impact to our industry and to especially in content and media and, and entertainment. You need to fully understand the process of microservices, how it works and where we're going to start seeing more uh, risk introduced to our environment with microservices. So if I am talking to a future CISO, my advice to them is stay into the know as much as possible, you know, study the technology, understand the technology. Of course, you still will have your management management duties. You still will have your executive duties, but take the time 25% a week just to make sure you're studying, you're reading up on technology, you're understanding, you know, new services, new products, you know, if there's different languages being used across your organization, understand why the developers and understand why the DevOps and the SREs are using what they're using, the purpose behind it, the business reasoning, and that will help you kind of project and forecast a program, a cloud security program, an InfoSec program, that is not only going to provide security, but it's going to provide business value because it supports the existing people, processes, and technology. So, Jonathan, thanks. This has been great. Thanks a lot for coming onto the show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And I hope you join us for the next one. 
Thanks for listening to The Secure Developer. That's all we have time for today. To find additional episodes and full transcriptions, visit thesecuredeveloper.com. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or get involved in the community, find us on Twitter at at DevSecCon. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes if you enjoyed today's episode. Bye for now.